Wow, what an entertaining movie. There is a great story, true, I hope, about how Jean Negalesco came to direct it. His agent was a real character, a brash, flamboyant guy named Frank Orsatti, whom everybody described as a gangster type. In order to finally secure Negalesco a long-promised second directing gig, Orsatti made a $10,000 wager with Jack Warner that if his client directed The Mask of Demetrios, he'd end up winning an Oscar for Best Director. Well, that didn't happen, and I'm sure Orsatti never paid off, but in the end, Jack Warner didn't care because the studio had a hit, and Negalesco was off and running on a career that included such memorable films as Roadhouse, Humoresque, How to Marry a Millionaire, and Three Coins in the Fountain. Now, Eric Ambler based the character of Demetrios Markopoulos, mysterious and mercurial war profiteer, on Greek industrialist Basil Zaharoff, who at the turn of the 20th century became one of the richest men in the world, mostly through arms dealing. Zaharoff exploited advancements in automatic weapons and submarines by playing on the fears of nations with long histories of conflict. He fostered hostility between various bordering countries so he could sell weapons to all sides, sometimes while knowing the munitions were faulty. He'd sell weapons to one country, then for their protection, he'd push a double order on their neighbors, on and on, back and forth. He used political connections to start conflicts purely for personal profit. And these tactics earned him the nickname, the Merchant of Death. But it didn't stop the British government from granting him knighthood for contributions to the military during World War I. Graham Greene also used Zaharoff as the basis for corrupt industrialist Sir Marcus in his 1936 novel, A Gun for Sale, later made as This Gun for Hire. Zaharoff has appeared either as himself or in fictionalized form in dozens of books and films since his death in 1936. The character of Colonel Haki of the Turkish secret police was played by veteran Polish actor Kurt Koch. The colonel gets one of Ambler's best lines, aimed not only at Dimitrios, but at Zaharoff and his real-life ilk. But to me, the most important thing to know about that assassination is not who fired a shot, but who paid for the bullet. Colonel Haki would appear in Eric Ambler's 1940 novel, Journey into Fear, and was played in the 1943 RKO film version by the movie's producer and nominal director, Orson Welles. As I mentioned at the top, Faye Emerson appeared in three more movies with Zachary Scott, and he probably paid her a bit more deference after this first one. That's because a few months after The Mask of Demetrios was released, Emerson married her fiancé, Elliot Roosevelt, making her the daughter-in-law of the President of the United States. Although she lived in the White House up until FDR's death in 1945, she continued to make movies, including Danger Signal and Her Kind of Man, both with Zachary Scott. Her final Hollywood film was Nobody Lives Forever in 1946, directed by Jean Negalesco. After that, Emerson left Hollywood for New York, where she became a part-time journalist and full-time socialite. After divorcing Roosevelt, she became one of the most fashionable TV hostesses of the 1950s. But she must have really loved Zachary Scott, because in 1950, she returned to the big screen one last time for Guilty Bystander, a grimy bargain basement indie shot in New York's Bowery, in which Scott plays a drunk detective searching for his kidnapped son. By that time, Scott was pretty much done with movies himself. After entering the business like gangbusters, the actor found himself typecast as a smooth, smarmy cad, a part he played to perfection as Monty Barragon in 1945's Mildred Pierce. The only director to see him differently was French master Jean Renoir, who cast Scott in the title role of sympathetic cotton farmer in his 1945 film The Southerner. Otherwise, Scott was forever sipping martinis and sneering his way through films like Ruthless, Whiplash, and Flamingo Road, sporting snooty monikers like Horace Woodruff Vendig, Rex Durant, and Fielding Carlisle. Well, Scott put a game face on for the studio and the press, but he detested the typecasting. And it didn't help when in 1950 his wife Elaine, they'd been married for 16 years, 
left him for John Steinbeck. Yes, that one, the Grapes of Wrath guy. Elaine had been introduced to the writer by Ann Southern, of all people, while Southern and Scott were making Shadow on the Wall at MGM. Now, during the 50s, Scott focused more on stage work and married noted Broadway actress Ruth Ford, with whom he'd stay until his death from a brain tumor in 1965. For the record, Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet made nine films together. Chronologically, they are The Maltese Falcon, Casablanca, Background to Danger, another Eric Ambler, Passage to Marseille, The Mask of Demetrios, The Conspirators, Hollywood Canteen, Three Strangers, and The Verdict. And before some wise guy tweets or posts a tenth on Facebook, I'm purposely not counting 1942's this is our life, where they appear as extras, not in credited roles. Tell us your favorite Green Street and Lori film over on the Noir Alley Facebook page or on our Twitter feed. And argue all you want, just be back here next week when we take a train into war-ravaged Germany for the politically charged post-war mystery Berlin Express. Until then, let's ruminate on how little kindness there is in the world today.